Welcome to CityWorks, a co-production of the City University of New York School of Labor and Urban Studies and CUNY TV. I'm Laura Flanders. Each month here on CityWorks, we explore the challenges and lived experiences of working people on the job, at home, and in our communities. On today's program, Pride in the Labor Movement, LGBTQ plus activism and leadership have been on the rise in recent years in organized labor. These activists are leading the charge in union campaigns at Starbucks, the News Guild, the Writers Guild of America, and many graduate student unions across the country, to name just a handful. With LGBTQ plus people in leadership now front and center among a new generation of labor militants, we ask, what has led to this rise of LGBTQ presence in unions and other social movements? And why is the labor movement such a fertile ground for this development? Will this prominence of queer folks in the fight for worker rights further empower both the queer folks and the movement in the fight against violence and the quest for social justice for everyone? With us today to help us unravel these questions is Professor Joanna Wiest of Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts, who's researched and written about the prominent role LGBTQ plus leaders are playing in today's labor movement. But first, we welcome Richard Blum, longtime staff attorney in the Employment Law Unit of the Legal Aid Society. He's an early member of Pride at Work, a founding board member of Queers for Economic Justice, and a member of the LGBTQ plus caucus of his union, which is the Association of Legal Aid Attorneys, UAW Local 2325. Ricky, may I call you that? Yes. Welcome to CityWorks. It's so glad to see you, my friend. Glad to see you. <laughs> We should just state at the outset that we have both of us seen a lot of change over our lifetimes as queer people with a care and a heart for unions and labor. Um, if you were to single out one example of leadership today that perhaps would have been unimaginable when you started out, I'm going to guess 70s, 80s, 90s, take your pick. <laughs> Who would it be? I started Legal Aid in, the 19, in 1990. Um, I would say that the leadership, the queer leadership in the Starbucks union campaign has been the thing that has most excited me, um, partly because the campaign itself has so much excited me and has that quality of a real grassroots movement. Um, so I think, uh, you know, that's the kind of leadership. It isn't one person. It's about groups of people coming together and acting in solidarity. So to talk a bit about the, the role that LGBTQ people are playing is to jump over the question of why there is a need for unions among queer folks. Um, talk a bit about what is the reality for LGBTQ plus people in the workforce today, because the statistics are pretty dire and, and quite different sometimes from the kind of cultural representation we have of queer glamour. Yeah. Well, I've often pointed out that all of us, really, almost all of us, survive on some combination of money from the labor market, our families, and the government. And if all three of those things are hostile to you, you're in trouble. Um, this is why you know, I sort of cut my teeth in these issues in the context of welfare reform, or so-called so welfare reform, and why QEJ started with a meeting that was called um, Why Welfare Reform is a Queer Issue. Because queer people, if you're excluded from the labor market, if you're not even hired in the first place, or if you're so badly bullied that you can't hold a job, um, then where do you turn? Well, if your family doesn't accept you, then where do you turn? The government. Well, if the government is there to discipline you, to teach you to be a good employee, and to get along with your family, you're really in trouble. Yeah. So I think that, you know, the, the, that there's a deep um, consciousness among uh, workers who are queer, that they need to have some kind of position and power, collective power in the workplace, because their vulnerability is so enormous. They also have the experience, most of us, right, of coming out often, uh, not always, obviously, but often under adverse circumstances and having to challenge. It's, you know, maybe your family accepts you, maybe not, but if not your family, then your school, your whoever, you know, in your life, your, your circle of friends, uh, people around you in the neighborhood whoever it is, that we've had the experience of having to be, having to challenge um, the norms and uh, 
uh, mores of people in authority around us. So we've been through that round already by the time we get to the workplace. So how is it changing the labor movement, you think? We, we, we often talk on this program about how the labor movement is changing with more women, more people of color, more immigrants, more worker centers feeding into the movement, um, non-formal unions feeding into the movement. How is the labor movement being changed by all this presence of Well, labor? I think you now, you know, you now hear um, when, when labor leaders speak, they include LGBTQ people, at least they give lip service yeah. to those issues now, which was unheard of when I started out. Um, and I think you also see it being articulated sincerely. So I'll give you a good example from a month ago. Um, I, was, I was lucky enough to be able to attend the uh, community action or you know, political action conference, national conference of the UAW. I'm a longtime UAW member, and I won a lottery with my local to go. Yeah, you um, water workers. <laughs> and, um, you know, we, opened, we had an opening speech by Sean Fain, the current president of the UAW, who's a remarkable person. And I had been following, the, you know, every broadcast during the strike, you know, carefully um, and with rapt attention. Uh, and he's a remarkable leader, visionary, strategic. And his theme was that the owning class is trying to divide us and we have to stand together, a worker's a worker's a worker. Um, and in his sort of riff on this, uh, one of the examples he gave was he said, whatever the gender identity or sexual orientation of the person next to you on the assembly line, you're your coworker, yeah. you know, you're your sibling in this. Um, now, to have a, the, uh, the leader of a national industrial manufacturing union make a point of talking about solidarity from that perspective was extraordinary to me. And I have to say, speaking to some of the other queer people who were there, we were all very moved by this. Mm, I bet. You know, and I think sometimes we're a little jaded, um, but that really hit me. Yeah. And the flip side, of course, of this is that this very nexus between queers and labor, organized queers and organized labor, is a target for the right. I was looking at the Heritage Foundation's hundreds of pages long agenda for the next conservative administration. It doesn't matter who the candidate is, they're ready with their plan, Project 2025. You can find out more about it if you want online. Um, but their number one first action of the Labor Department they want is to strip out not the employment protections that currently exist for LGBT people in federal law, meaning for federal employees, which are the ones that we have. I thought that was extraordinary, that that was the first thing they were going to go for, to strip those protections away for federal employees. That, it seemed to me, indicated that they see a strength there that maybe even queer organizers in the labor movement aren't seeing yet. Do you mean you think that they see strength on our side? Yes. Yes, I think that's true. As I think that's, that's a true. string they want to pull to unravel something. Yes. Well, and we know that you know, trans people in particular have become a favorite target. You know, other, they've sort of given up on gay marriage, I think. Uh, that's just too popular these days uh, to, to win a fight, a wedge fight over. So, the, you know, trans people are the new wedge, or one of the new wedges. Um, and um, yes, I think the backlash comes from, is a sign of the success of, of, uh, of the movement. Where do you think the front line is now for this movement, these two movements that you bring together in your life? What are you working on today? Um, we still haven't gotten national health care, so that's Yeah, I would say agenda. let's start with access <laughs> to health care and, again, gender-appropriate, culturally appropriate health care. Um, but I'll start with health care. <laughs> um, and violence. I mean, I think we have to deal with violence. Um, you know, the, there's been a lot of discussion in recent times, in recent years, about um, sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, but we have to understand that, um, first of all, sexual harassment isn't only men against women, and it's not only about, you know, sort of the, 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 the power play of, of straight men. Uh, it's more complicated than that. But it's about power, of power abuse, and that violence in the workplace of various forms still exists. Yeah. Bullying is real. Um, everyone should read um, Anne Bailey's books, um, Steel Closets, about LGBTQ steel workers in 
Gary, Indiana, and uh, Semi Queer, my Semi Queer, my favorite book title uh, about queer truckers. Um, and you really appreciate the day to day risk of violence in the workplace for queer people. We at QEJ had a forum on workplace bullying. Now, this is, must be over 10 years ago at this point. Um, one of the speakers was um, a woman who is a member of Labor's Local 79, one of my favorite unions. Um, and she teaches a course called Respect in the Workplace. So this is someone who is an out African-American lesbian who at that time had worked five years already in construction, mostly union construction. And she was talking about the hazing of women generally. because She was saying it really isn't so much about her being a lesbian. It's that women get hazed in construction projects, right? But then I asked her, and she, she said that she would you know, never want to work in a non-union construction project, that within a union construction project, at least you have some place to go, some place to turn, and there's a structure for combating that stuff on the ground right there. And I've written about this, the importance of having power on the ground if you're serious about anti-discrimination laws and reality for people. But I, then I asked her, because um, I think she'd had you know, quite a track record um, as an advocate for women. I said, how many out gay men have you met on the job in your five years in construction as a very visible out lesbian? She said, none. That's the kind of safety we're talking about. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ricky. Thank you for all your work. And I encourage people to continue to watch this program. We had Anne Bailey on not so long ago. Oh, great. Wonderful speaking with you. We're going to take a quick break and return with Joanna Wiest. You are watching CityWorks. The CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies is the 25th and newest school under the CUNY umbrella. Dedicated to public service and social justice, the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies offers undergraduate and graduate degrees in the areas of labor studies and urban studies and certificate programs in labor relations, public administration and public policy, healthcare policy and administration, and community leadership. We pride ourselves on being an institution that brings together activists and academics. Find out more at slu.cuny.edu. Welcome back to CityWorks. Joining me now is Joanna Wiest, Assistant Professor of Politics at Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts. She specializes in gender and sexuality politics. Her article on the prominent role that LGBTQ plus leaders are playing in today's labor movement appears in the Spring 24 edition of New Labor Forum, the journal published by the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. So first off, just congratulations so much on this super important article. You make a case that LGBTQ advocacy has become central to the new union militancy. Where are we seeing it, just in a nutshell? What kind of examples do you think of? So we're really seeing the kind of centering of sexual and gender workers' rights and particular issues that are important to them across the labor movement in general. Uh, for one, we see established unions like the American Federation of Teachers and the National uh, Education Association fighting for their rank and file workers' rights uh, as they face kind of crackdowns in states like Florida with these new don't say gay laws and other laws that are attacking uh, both queer students, but also any teachers uh, that are teaching these kind of issues in the classroom. We see uh, unions like the UAW establishing new queer caucuses United Steel workers uh, adding gender affirming health care to their health care plans for workers as well as their families who might need access to that potentially life saving yeah. uh, care. And we're also seeing these issues centered by new unions like Starbucks Workers United, who this past summer staged a kind of nationwide action when their parent company, this kind of supposed uh, vanguardist in corporate America for trans rights was saying, we need to take down pride decorations. We can't have anything that looks like we're celebrating queer <laughs> life. Uh, and that's because I think those workers saw this as a real capitulation yeah. to this new anti-queer uh, rights trend that we see across and the country. And as you, the point you make in the article, one of them is that this makes perfect sense for LGBTQ workers to get involved in unions because they're often the bottom of the economic barrel, right? Yeah, exactly. So we see 
uh, statistics put out by the Williams Institute recently that shows that uh, LGBTQ plus Americans experience on whole higher rates of poverty than their straight cisgender peers. And importantly, that's in a country where we already have very high rates yeah. of debt, inadequate health insurance, uh, particularly at will employment is already very widespread. We know housing instability is widespread. And then they're kind of at the lower rung of that. Uh, trans people uh, actually experience, exhibit even higher rates of poverty than most other cross sections of the queer population. And when we see kind of attempts to dig into the sources of those disparities, uh, those like the Human Rights Campaign have put out reports saying that this is largely rooted in what they called, quote, some of society's most challenging issues. And those included unaffordable health care, workplace discrimination, reduced employment opportunities, just all sorts of things that unions mm. uh, already kind of provide uh, to their workers. Finally, there may be people that say, OK, well, aren't there also nonprofit groups, great advocacy organizations? You mentioned the Human Rights Campaign not long ago. Don't those groups work effectively to defend LGBT workers? I wouldn't want to say that those groups don't do things like pursue these kinds of Title VII protections in the law. I think we see a lot of national civil rights and LGBTQ plus nonprofits being really instrumental to opening those doors uh, in the courts. And that has a real impact for workers. But at the same time, those nonprofits are very beholden to wealthy donors. Oftentimes, even corporations funnel money into these nonprofits. And it just means that they're not able or willing to fight for the things that would really kind of improve LGBTQ plus workers' lives as a whole. In other words, uh, we're never going to see them fighting for single payer health care. Uh, we're not going to see them fighting for, you know, all the sorts of really rich, substantive things that unions and working class organizations in general struggle for. Try as we might. And then finally, there's two points that you make in your piece that I want to make sure we just touch on, although I encourage people to check out New Labor Forum. Um, one is how unions have been able to sort of pierce the illusion of these so-called culture wars as kind of a distraction from what is really the economic motivation underlying a lot of these campaigns. Um, there's one example that you've mentioned in Florida. Are there others? So culture war is one of the greatest kind of misnomers in American politics. And that's because even if we go back decades and decades before Ron DeSantis's kind of targeting, targeting of uh, queer people and trans people in the state of Florida while pursuing kind of plutocratic politics and the destruction of unions kind of more generally, we see that trend all the way back at least to the 1970s in California, where you had a very similarly kind of fundamentally anti-labor, anti-working class state senator named John Briggs. And he thought it would be a great way to divide the working class by passing this uh, ballot initiative uh, that would have barred gay and lesbian teachers from working in public schools. And unions across California, uh, many of which were not exactly run by the most queer friendly people in the world. I think this was before we had kind of queer caucuses and rich representation in these unions. They realized that an injury to one was an injury to all, and they knew what John Briggs was doing here. And they successfully thwarted and beat back that ballot initiative. And so again, I think we can see that uh, where these kind of right-wing politicians want to divide workers, they want to scapegoat queer people on route to destroying labor and public schools and public goods more generally. Uh, uh, these things kind of show us why it, we're not experiencing kind of culture wars right now, but rather this kind of scapegoating of queer people. And unions can get it done. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joanna Wiest. Really helpful. Again, the article we've been referring to is in the spring issue of New Labor Forum from the City University of New York School of Labor and Urban Studies. Joanna, thanks a lot. Recently, I hosted a virtual public program at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies about transgender-led movement building, in which we explored campaigns and strategies for protecting transgender rights and generating political and worker power for LGBTQIA plus communities in an election year. Here are some highlights from that program. 
but we con we constantly hear stories of our transgender community constantly getting fired for the littlest, smallest thing. And it's literally because of who they are, because they started to transition, because they started to express how they how they want to be um, affirmed. Um, they changed their name. And so we see also large growing amounts of um, extremist right groups coming into local school boards or school districts to organize against trans youth and all the hard work that many uh, youth activists, LGBT activists, trans activists had worked so hard over decades to get to. Um, and those rights and those areas of gains are being eroded every day. And so we need to reinforce, we need to build up, we need to um, really reach out to our allies, but also organize within and making sure that we have coalitions, that we have uh, alliances that are strong, that are healthy, that are actually uh, working towards that systemic change we need. I think nationally, um, I would like to see people on the left meet people, match the energy of people on the right. I think, you know, Biden for the several, for the past several years has been telling trans people that he has our backs. And someone once recently said, we're still waiting to see how Biden has our back specifically. I think that the um, federal government's inability to pass the Equality Act is a clear demonstration of them being derelict in their duty when in 30 plus states in this country, you can marry whoever you want, but you can be fired um, or you can be evicted rather um, or denied services based upon your gender identity and expression. I think that we know rather that there's a well-funded, well-coordinated effort on, on the right to um, eliminate transgender people from public life. Um, and, they're, and, and they just are organized. They're all equally wacky um, and they are thinking strategic and long-term. And here we are on the left afraid to utter the words transgender or afraid to lean in and be unapologetic about our support for people, regardless of how they identify. I feel that this is a, a incredibly important time to organize, but I, it, it's, the solution is not going to come from the top. It never has and it never will. And we have to push it from the bottom. And that means organizations like my organization align with organizations that do do that electoral-based organizing work moving beyond then just these strategies towards strategies that are really gonna build power and change systems. Because when a black trans woman is able to be housed and not have to worry about where her next meal is, that will benefit all of us, all of us, all our conditions are raised by that, by those opportunities. And so whether it's foster kids, whether it's um, trans folks getting support um, through UBI, universal basic income programs of that sort, these are important fundamental programs that will lift and change lives. And the more those lives are changed for the better, the more our communities will be as a whole. This is certainly a time period where there's a need for all of us to show up, to speak out. And we can do that in many different ways. My advice to young uh, or up and coming trans leaders, advocates, activists is you don't have to always be in advocacy. You have a right to live a soft, peaceful, normal life. And it's okay for you to do that too. And that is also a contribution to our community because doing this work for several years, I find that if you, it is, all, it is physically and mentally draining and exhausting the over politicization of trans people, the fact that trans people are the pathway to the White House in 2024 is just, you know, absurd. And I think that it can really dwell. We can really dwell on it. And I think that if we do that too much, we will deprive ourselves of the joy that we deserve as human beings. And so I just want to remind trans people that um, it can feel like just being trans means being a calling into advocacy and activism. And that's not the case. And I think that if that's for you, then great, do it. But if not, there are so many ways that you can contribute to the advancement and the betterment of our community. 
Um, we need to be in all circles and spaces, in the front and the back, inside, outside, all of it. So I feel like I knew my privilege and um, and I decided to stand up and not hide be behind the shadows of a cisgender woman. Um, I said, you know what, I'm a transgender woman, I'm proud and I'm standing up for my sister. So I wanted to give people um, a voice that they have, a voice for themselves. So that's my drive. And just to see my community grow, um, I, I, I hope and pray that we are all able to grow and be resilient and just be able to live authentic lives. Those were some highlights from a panel discussion on transgender-led organizing and strategies for building political, social, and worker power for LGBTQIA plus communities this election year. It was organized by the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. That's it for CityWorks. If you have comments or questions, write to us at cityworks at slu.cuny.edu. For CityWorks, I'm Laura Flanders. Thanks for watching.